right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Let me hear it. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for getting up on a cold morning and joining us here at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, we'll just say a few brief words before the panel begins. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Maybe. I'm one of the co-founders of Art and Feminism. Um, unfortunately, our dear collaborator, Mackenzie Mack, uh, was stuck in North Carolina because of yesterday's awesome weather. Um, so we just want to acknowledge their labor and we're really devastated they couldn't make it today because uh, just, you know, their fierce intelligence and humor has changed this project. Um, so I'm Sean Evans. I'm also one of the co-founders of Art and Feminism. And just to give you a, a little quick framing for any of you who don't know much about us. Um, so we started this project five years ago um, and we really like thought that a handful of our friends would show up, um, and they did, and a lot more people showed up. So since 2014, over 7,000 people at more than 500 events around the world have participated in art and feminism edit-a-thons, and that's resulted in the creation or improvement of about 11,000 articles on Wikipedia, so that's what you're a part of today. <laughs> And it's, uh, I'm Michael Mandeberg. I'm one of the co-founders uh, also. Um, it's somewhat uh, rote to start an event with thank yous, but I think it's really important to do so here because this really could not have been possible without so many other people's and other projects' support. Um, first and foremost, we want to thank MoMA's Department of Education. Um, we've really, this is our fourth time organizing here, we've really found a wonderful home in which to um, build this project out of. In particular, we want to thank Sarah Bodinson and Jenny Tobias, who've been uh, working with us on this project since the first year in which we um, have held it here. Um, we also want to thank the Modern Women's Fund and the Wikimedia Foundation, um, for whom, with whom, without whose support this project would not be able to happen here today. In particular, a shout out to uh, Winifred Olaf, who's been helping us uh, from the foundation. Um, we want to thank PowerArts for their continued support. Um, we want to thank our fiscal sponsor, Qubit, um, for putting up with our last minute requests for changes to the food order from Fairways. <laughs> um, we want to thank our wiki allies, uh, Afro Crowd, Black Lunch Table, Wikimedia New York City, Women in Red. We want to thank our amazing volunteers, some of whom are sitting outside right now, making sure everyone can come and get logged in rather than being in here with us. That's how dedicated they are. In particular, uh, we want to thank um, Sarah Klugich, who's been helping us organize them. And last, and certainly not least, certainly the most important are you, the participants. Thank you for coming here with us um, year after year to help make this happen. I, I'm sorry, I'm just reading a script. Um, and oh yeah, blame it on us. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> and we want to thank our panelists for sure. Yes, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Caroline Sinders. Uh, I actually work at Wikimedia, but I'm here as an independent arts practitioner and designer. But I work on the anti-harassment tools team. And I'm really excited to moderate this panel. Uh, I think this is the first time the keynote panel at Art and Feminism has had a title. Let's be careful with each other so we can be dangerous together. Um, this is one of my favorite adages. It's an old socialist adage, but I think it's really important when we start to think about the systems and collaborations and communities we build, how important it is to be safe, uh, supportive of one another, while we're trying to do incredibly difficult things. How do we build networks that are sustainable? How do we build these sustainable networks so we together can address inequality? I want to give a big shout out to Art and MoMA. Uh, otherwise, why would we be here? <laughs> um, and I want to introduce some of our lovely speakers. Uh, so we will have Sadette Harry. Uh, a, incredible researcher, editor, writer, who's with the Mozilla Foundation. Sarah Jaffe, an amazing author and writer on labor. Uh, she's one of my favorites. And Salome Asiga, an amazing artist who, I'm, she's describing a lot of her work later, and I don't even think I could do it justice, but one of my favorite artists. And I will be your moderator. Um, this is how you can follow us on the internet, particularly on Twitter.
And uh, I'm going to do a quick sort of presentation on some work I've been li looking at. Um, how do you create emotional data sets? So because I work uh, in technology, um, I think a lot about how our emotions are sort of translated on the internet, but how they're caught and saved. Uh, my, the majority of my practice focuses on online harassment, but also in ways in which the systems we exist in have been inadequately designed. I think it's important to bring up when we think about what are, what are networks that exist to support us to be radical online? Can they allow us to be angry? Can they allow us to be safe? Can we be tenacious? Can we be bold? Can we also be scared? All of our interactions online are, are caught and quantified. So that means our emotions are caught into different kinds of ways um, and classified. They can be fed back into advertising systems. They can be analyzed for new kinds of products being made. But I like to think about how when we're trying to take things that are hard to describe, hard to do, our emotions, how are they mislabeled? So the majority of my work really does focus on this idea of how do you take something inherently qualitative like emotions and put them into quantitative systems? And how does it break down? Because it always will break. Some work I find truly inspiring is Mimi Onawa's Missing Data Sets. Uh, she recently completed a residency at IBM and Studio XX in Montreal. A lot of her work really addresses what does it mean to not be in a data set. Um, a fascinating part of her work also addresses how you can be safe not being seen in data, but how do you also, uh, if you're not actually considered a data point, how are you left out of systems? Um, her work, I recommend all of you. Uh, look at more. I wish I had more time to dig into it. Uh, some of my work, again, as I talked about addressing emotions and data, um, really does address how do you think of emotions even outside of bigger systems. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, and about, I would say, you know, um, 11 years ago, a really traumatic event happened, Hurricane Katrina. And one of the things I find fascinating when you start to think about what is a hurricane uh, if you were to Google search Hurricane Katrina, for example, one of the first results does come from Wikipedia, but it is talking about the weather data associated with hurricanes. So how does a hurricane get described inside of bigger te technical systems? It gets broken down into the parameters of what it is, which is weather. But the ramifications of Hurricane Katrina are not just weather ramifications, uh, they're emotional ones. And I realized uh, I had, in the past 11 years, created this emotional data set, this emotional archive because I've been photographing my family for 11 years. My background's in photography before I got a master's in technology. And what I realized what I had was an emotional data set. I've been working with a technologist to actually uh, break apart this data set and sort of train a neural net on it. And here's an example of how I've been describing and annotating and archiving different images. And, why, uh, and I think this project does a good job of explaining this slide. Every data point about online harassment or every data point about emotions on the internet is a person's traumatic experience. I'm going to go back for a second. These are images, but they mean something to me. They may mean something to, something to someone else. How would a system archive these images or look at them or label them? Would they label them appropriately? How do we think about saving spaces like or creating or looking at events related to online harassment? We have to keep this in mind. Uh, I like to make charts and diagrams because I'm a technologist. But I also think about how would a system take something as traumatic as doxing and actually analyze it. What is doxing? There's a definition to it. It's the release of public documents. But the releasing of public documents makes people incredibly unsafe. It's not a benign thing. It's someone's traumatic experience. It's a way that exposes them to danger. But where does doxing come from and what does it look like? Where does it go? And do you have good or bad doxing? When can doxing be used for good in terms of political activism? Um, how do we separate these things? The context of doxing suddenly changes when you look at it uh, when you look at it from a protest perspective. But who gets to define what that kind of protest is, and how do we determine good and bad? A system can't recognize that. A person can. And a lot of our systems, when they when they are translated into technology, this context is lost. So I guess the bigger point I'm making here is how do we think about data and emotional data, but how it actually relates to people. Data is about people. It's both contextual and qualitative. And every data set that we have, every data point on the internet, when it's caught and captured, has political and emotional ramifications, especially if we aren't defining what that data is and we are building context into it. I guess the point of this talk is really to think about how non-benign data is, how political it is, and how emotional it can be when we exist inside of these larger systems. And systems that we don't actually have a lot of equity in. Do we get to define what harassment is in certain spaces? Do we get to see or pull back or look at how that harassment is handled? Do we get to have a say 
in what our harassment looks like? Do we get to add context to it? And a lot of digital systems, we don't at all. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Salome. I'm an artist and researcher. I'm also a fellow, a current fellow at the Ford Foundation. Um, and before I get into my projects, I want to give us a couple of anchor po points in the history of collecting and exhibiting African diasporic cultural artifacts. Um, so in my work, I'm always trying to answer this question, how are cultural artifacts uh, preserved, recorded, shared, celebrated? Um, so before institutions were collecting objects, they were exhibiting people. Um, this is Odebenga Jones. Um, he, Odebenga, he's a Congolese man who was um, sold to the Bronx Zoo and exhibited in the Monkey House by explorer Samuel Werner. Um, you can see that uh, while he was exhibited in the Monkey House, they chiseled his teeth to make him look more, an more animal-like. Um, and this was in the 1900s. And even before then, there's an earlier case of Sarji Bartman, one of two South African women who were exhibited, who was exhibited um, in freak show attractions all across Europe. Uh, she went by, um, or the character was Hot and Top Venus. Um, and then when we do get to objects, many of our museums and institutions have robust collections of objects. But when we look at the credit line, the, uh, the credit line points to um, the object's acquisition, which again kind of relates a story uh, of seizure. And we could even zoom out further to how black contemporary culture is recorded and shared. And again, similar narratives of seizure and appropri appropriation exist. Um, so this, I'm gonna go through one, one of my projects, just give you like the bare bones skeleton. So this is the opera repository. It's a future museum space that collects artifacts made by and for people of African descent. So all of the, all of the objects in our collection are speculative. Um, it's a project I started through an IBM residency with uh, Ayo Demola Okunsende, uh, another artist. Uh, so the way we develop our collection is through a series of workshops where we get participants to become archivists of our future museum space. And they play this card game that Ask them to think about the future in different domains. So you're given a narrative card, a domain card, and an object card. Uh, the narrative card sort of puts you in a headspace of, of this future world. So we have words like utopia, dystopia, <laughs> revolutionary, etc. Domain um, gives you a field to design for. So things like education, fashion, health. Uh, and then object asks you to think about one physical quality this artifact must have. And then we have them design, sketch these objects on very official documents that we, we archive. Um, and then we think about like a value exchange. So if they're submitting, if our participants are uh, submitting an artifact idea, we then teach them how to build this, build out this idea, prototype the idea in some capacity. So we have a basic electronic component workshop where we use things like microprocessors and LEDs and motors and build out our artifacts. We also have a VR engineering portion where we get folks in tilt brush and headsets and have them draw the objects in 3D space. We've also introduced a digital fabrication element, so getting people familiar with um, 3D printing and laser cutting. And then we take these basic prototypes back to our studio and fully realize them. So here's an example of an artifact that's come out of one of our workshops. Um, this is Artifact 21. It's a sensory suit that gives you the sensation of being underwater. The person who designed this was thinking a lot about the post-traumatic um, stress that comes with being a person of color, color a, a black person, and a relationship to water traveling the transatlantic, transatlantic slave um, it's a tr tr sorry, with the transatlantic slave trade experience. So yeah, crossing crossing water, um, and so it's supposed to be therapeutic, giving you giving you um, the calming sensation of being under underwater. And so we fully realized the suit. There are vibrator motors at each one of these cuffs that are synced to the tidal patterns of the Atlantic Ocean, and there wa there's water that pumps all around. 
Um, and then we make films of each of our finished artifacts that also sit in our archive. And that's me. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sudet Harry, and I am a first-generation black far-rock toxic null data point. And what I want to talk about is who's this we again? When we discuss art and editing and creation of work, there is often a desire to get right to the interesting, to the sexy, to the design. But the most important thing I always ask is, who is we, fam? Because we does not necessarily include everyone. And as we write, as we collect, as we go on about making of art, we have to consider deeply what our supposed group, collection, and objectivity is. Oh, no. I saw this. So the story of these is that I'm right, these slides have been done three or four times with multiple emails to so people going, something happened and I'm burning it all. So th this is from Timothy Ann Burnside. I did get the request, but the museum is presented as an illegal mechanism of colonialism. And along with that, a space, space which does not even welcome those whose culture it displays. And is there anything incorrect about that? And this is Michael B. Jordan from behind. This is the second time he's in one of my presentations. And <laughs> This was important to me because it's true. What makes art? What makes history? What makes good and bad? To create a museum, you basically have to create an exclusive space that brings some things in and puts some things out. That is how we define art. What is interesting is that we do not extend that to our understanding of how we define history, how we define data, how we define data sets. Big data is often, is, is often described as beginning when somebody puts up together a computer or something like that. Or even in longer code studies, people have decided looking at Negro code laws or things of chattel slavery. I think one, and my work, when I don't do the work of work, is we got to go farther back. The Treaty of Tordesillas, binary code as art, as history, as complete and utter fiction. In 1494, that number should sound really close to a num another number we hear a lot, we're told that Spain, actually Seville, and, and Portugal got together and drew a line with the Pope to define which, who got what side of the world. Now, this line is utter bullshit. Excuse my friend. Sorry, there are any kids in the room. Spain and Portugal had already been trading with Arab slave traders, had already been trading with African nations, and had known the, and know, knew the world was round. This is theater, but it sets the world up as a zero and a one. And it sets the world up as a zero and a one with the authority of no less than God. It's not true, it's not honest, but who is going to deny the theater when the man governed by God himself says that the world is between me and you? Anyone who does not abide by this is breaking the code. They're a glitch in the code. England becomes a glitch in the code. Africa becomes a glitch in the code. There's your zero, there's your one. As we code, anything that is not that doesn't matter. And anything that is not that is a transgression. They are breaking the law by not being in your code. As such, everyone who does not apply to our certain definitions of we, of us, is not part of the code. They are not part of the people who are here. We have to do something very, very important and very, very hard. We have to do multiple things at once with the understanding that we cannot go back to a thing that never existed. There is, the museum is violent. The world is violent. It is anti-black. It is anti-woman. It is an, the very definition of gender is violent. The definition of race is violent. The definition of how we go through the world commits violence and hierarchy among people. But we still have to do the work. We still have to do articles. We still have to change with the idea that we are going towards a system that will someday imagine something better. I'm not, I don't actually exist in data. If I put my hands under an automatic faucet, if it's not the right color, I won't show up. If you ask people where I am from, you will diverge to four diff different continents within three generations. And yet, 
I am still here. So once again, who is this we, fam? Clearly I drew the short straw because I have to go after Sadat. <laughs> yeah, um, all of you people are incredible and wonderful and thank you all for being here at a, an early, early hour on a Saturday morning. I just got back, um, I'm a labor journalist and I just got back from a labor conference and so I'm perhaps unsurprisingly going to talk about work. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the boss. Um, and this is my favorite picture. I've been obsessed with this picture since the, well, since it happened, which was, in fact, I think before Donald Trump was even sworn in, because um, this is the boss, right? I mean, Donald Trump is famous for firing people. That's what he does best. Um, but this is also the boss that we don't really think of as the boss. It's Sheryl Sandberg. It's Jeff Bezos, and I believe the other one is Larry Page of Google, whose face I don't recognize quite as easily. Um, and these are people who, um, not to put too fine a point on it, they exploit labor to make money. Um, that is what they do. Even Sheryl Sandberg, whose advice book sold millions of copies possibly to people in this room, um, that's what they do. And they exploit a bunch of different types of labor, and that's what I wanted to talk about here in my four minutes left. Um, but so I like to, you know, just sort of stick this up here and, and remind us that these people are not the resistance. They are happy to take this meeting. They were happy to take this meeting after Trump had repeatedly said racist, sexist things, been accused of racist, sexist violence. Um, and Mike Pence has literally been responsible for the largest AIDS outbreak in this country since the 1990s. Um, so these are not our friends. These are our friends. Um, <laughs> so this, this is IBM workers who began organizing after Trump was elected because their boss, uh, Ginny Rometty, whose name is on these signs, the CEO of IBM, had offered to work with Trump. And they were picturing, because IBM has a history of, among other things, building technology that made genocide possible during the Holocaust. Um, they said, never again, we are not okay with working for a company that is okay with potentially building technology for Muslim bans, registries, et cetera. Um, and so they went out and organized. Um, so I wanna talk about the workers in the tech industry that we think of when we think of who does the work, right? Because we think of these people, we think of coders, um, we think of programmers, we think of people who are well paid, who, you know, the, the cliche about working at Google or whatever is that there is a masseuse on, on hand and there's um, free frozen yogurt and all of this other fancy stuff, that it's a really fun place to work, that it's a labor of love. Um, this is where the art connection comes in, by the way, because the history of the labor of love goes back to two founding myths. One is women's unpaid work, and the other is unpaid art work. Um, so these workers often don't think of themselves as workers, which is why it's surprising to see them thinking of themselves as workers. These are the people who often think of themselves as workers, um, but we are also told they're not workers. These are Uber drivers on strike. Um, Uber is not a ride sharing company. It is a taxi hiring company that pays people not very much money in order to drive you around. Um, it is quote unquote disrupting a system that already existed. We live in New York City, most of us, so we know that you know you go outside, you hail a taxi. That's what Uber does, except it's on an app on your smartphone. Um, these are the workers that the so-called sharing economy makes invisible. Then there's a whole other set of workers that in the tech industry that are made invisible. Those workers are the service workers who make those free frozen yogurts for different, um, for Google employees, the ones who clean up afterwards. And those workers tend to be women. They tend to be immigrants. They are people of color. They are paid very badly. They certainly understand themselves as workers. And what's been happening in a few small places is that they are actually getting some solidarity from the well-paid tech workers. Um, so I wanna wrap up with the story of the workers at Lanatex, who are coders who actually tried to organize a union. They all got fired. So yesterday they had a protest. I unfortunately don't think 
that, no, it didn't get in as a slide, but um, because I was on a train this morning when I discovered it. And one of the workers tweeted that he and one of his co-workers who had been fired from Lanatix went from their march down to the Fight for 15 march. And they said to the Fight for 15 workers, um, they were telling their story, you know, they, we, we organized, they retaliated, and we're waiting on the National Labor Relations Board to make a decision. And the Fight for 15 workers said, same here, because ultimately we are all still in the same position, whether we are unpaid, well-paid, doing a quote-unquote labor of love or not. Uh, just a really quick, I think, round of applause for our speakers. I also want to, maybe this is a strange place to say this because we're at MoMA, we also don't have to talk about art, but we can. But one of the things I loved on all the different presentations is I think how we all touched on all these different specific aspects of inequity inside of systems and what data means either from an artistic perspective, a technical perspective, or even a labor perspective. And I, um, I guess one of the curiosities I have is, I always hate to ask, like, how do we move forward? But is there a way from all the different ways in which we're approaching this problem? So, um, like, Sarah, do you want to start? I mean, I think the way that we move forward is we understand the, the connections that we have. I was telling a story earlier about them. Um, the, the sort of labor of love thing is like, you know, we're gonna have a roller coaster in the parking lot or something. So Elon Musk tried to use that on the factory workers that make Tesla cars, who are trying once again to organize. And it's like, oh, we'll give you free frozen yogurt and we'll build a roller coaster in the parking lot. And that doesn't work in the same way on the workers who don't, like nobody goes to work at a Tesla factory or a Ford factory or a coal mine because they enjoy doing that work. They do it because they get paid. Um, and so to try to be like, oh, but it's fun. No, it's not fun. Putting a roller coaster in the parking lot is not going to make the assembly line not cause major injuries to the workers. And so to understand like the places where these ideologies fall apart and then the solidarities that can come out of that. So the workers who are doing the presumably very high-end coding that, that Tesla and all of the other things that Elon Musk does, like shoot cars into space, um, to understand that like, it's crap all the way down, he's still a boss. And to actually understand that we need to connect those dots is the way forward. I think we need to talk less about Elon Musk. And I think we need to start turning the workers from a large collective into people with names, with feelings, with their own histories and how those intertwine as actual identi identifiable individuals and not just masses. Because that in and of itself is the kind of dehumanization that I think that we often skip over. And it is part of what happens that encourages some of the work that Elon, Elon Musk and the bosses who are terrible do. Because it is important to know who people are and what they are and how they feel and how they move. And that we don't have a lot of that information. And I think part of moving forward is taking it from I, at this point, I think I know what t-shirt Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sheryl Sandberg wear. I know what t-shirt they wear. What is the largest immigrant, immigrant, immigrant group working in tech that does not work at a programmer level? What is the largest immigrant group that makes a first to second generation economic change? What are the skill levels of that? And also, what are the assumptions we make when we talk about who is and isn't available and who is and isn't part of work and tech and who isn't there. Because one thing that I would say is that I'm a union kid. 11.99 till I die, I was, my first union meeting was four years old. <laughs> it was the union of home healthcare workers of people who scrubbed floors for museums. It wasn't a using, that was my mom. She has a name, she has skills, she has things that she's been doing, and the way she might talk about her work is different than the way we are considering or may edit it and think about it, and we have to start shifting our focus from the people we think 
matter as singular versus masses to these are people affected by the work? I mean, I think about like how do we move forward in pushing and promoting digital equity through like an arts and cultural lens? I'm thinking, I'm so happy you included the slide about with the Black Panther still because I just saw Black Panther this week and I'm thinking about how, you know, I'm in my late 20s and I'm finally seeing myself on screen. Like I'm seeing, sh like looking at Shuri and I'm seeing this like smart, funny, like super fly, like black girl, like work with technology, you know? And I think about how I could have gone so much faster to this place I am in my work if I had had her sooner. Um, and so for me, I think, how do we move forward is sort of, is, is like having that representation, right? Like not only saying, like just the, the understanding that we have a, a legacy and continuum in this work and then promoting that, making that visible, making it super visible. Totally. And I think what I'm sort of, um, a lot of y'all's answers sort of touched on is also like at a high level, like a, a macro and micro. That's one, one of the things I really love about the work that Art and Feminism does is how do you see yourself reflected in, into these systems? How, like, how many different female artists or non-gender binary artists do you see inside of a space like, like Wikipedia? And I think it's so important to see yourself reflected inside of, inside of these systems. And it does become this, I think, balance of how do we collectively organize but also then highlight individuals. Like you have to see the individual stories to connect to them but we also need to sort of be like a group together so we can be, I guess, ultimately incredibly dangerous. That is your title, right? I know. <laughs> yeah, it's really... No, no, finish. Oh, no, I just think that, right, we have to actually understand where each other are coming from. We have to actually think about solidarity that comes together across difference, right? Who... We're not all the same, obviously, looking around at this room. We do have to understand those individual stories to then figure out where we have things in common and frankly where we don't have things in common and we're gonna have to, wait, where those glitches are gonna come up like Sadat was saying. I also think that we have to admit that this is gonna be uncomfortable, it's going to be fractious yes. and it may not be safe. And when I say admit it, I mean actually admit it and deal with the discomfort and deal with the problems and deal with the fact that there might not be a joining. Like one of the things I say to some people is, I do work in community, I love it. I like the nerd work. I'm like, give me all of the archives. But I also got the opportunity to work because I have to be online. I have to present in a certain way. I have to use a certain amount of voice. And there's also a level of, for me, as a black woman, as a first generation immigrant, is all sorts of things. There is a lot of, well, you're being identified tentatarian and you're dividing us. And I'm like, well, would you like to fight me? I'm not being funny. I grew up in Far Rock. When I say, would you like to fight me? That is an actual invitation. <laughs> and it's an acknowledgement of something very real. Violence is on the table. Because violence to me is always on the table, but we don't talk about it. People say things and do things and label me in such ways that make going through the world hard. And I do that to people who I have privilege of. Sometimes I don't know. And it is, has to be within the scope of reconciliation of the work that some people may not be, come to a point where they are ever okay with us. But we can still work together. I can get you where you need to go, we can get where we need to go. We don't got it, but we can do it 50 miles apart. I want you to have healthcare. I don't want you to be in my backyard. And we don't have those discussions. We don't have those discussions where we admit that somebody might be angry enough to want to fight me. Now what do we do? I wanna like lift up what you said about there n potentially not being a, a joining, like a meeting place, because I think there's a real power in separatist organizing. There's a tech kind of language that um, we might have, right? That like will propel us to move faster to, you know, in, in our organizing efforts. And then we can find entry points along the way, but like, yes, like I really wanna hold on to this. Like there might not be a joining, you know? Yeah. When it becomes this, this sort of you know, it's become an internet cliche that it's not my job to educate you, but like this goes way back decades of organizing, which is like, it's on white people to handle white people who are being, who are, you know, it's on us to end white supremacy. It's, that doesn't mean that like, you know, I don't have to inflict it on other people. And I really love that you brought up that like, we don't have to like each other 
to have solidarity. We don't have to be friends. We don't have to agree on most things. Like this idea that like, you know, the left is gonna be this small group of people that are all friends with each other. That's just, it's not gonna happen. I sort of feel like this is uh, like, I think we need to redefine at times like what a community means. Cause again, like me, me desiring you to have safety does not mean I have to hold your hand or be your friend about it. And I think that's something I find really fascinating when we sort of look at like how community is defined from maybe a like positive, I'm gonna go give like an uplifting style TED talk to actually like the different varying definitions of community. Um, and I, I feel like that's something that's really worth unpacking a little bit more before we open it up to questions, but like how do we start to think about communities in different ways, again, like separatist action? Like a community can mean I want you to have health care, but that doesn't mean I want to be your friend necessarily. How do we define community? I guess, yeah, like is there like, you know, how, how can we think of new ways of like creating these like networks and creating ways to collaborate together with this idea of like mutual respect, but like how do we how do we start to like redefine or move our definitions of community forward? Um, and I guess I, it's something I want to like um, so that I'd love to hear you sort of talk about that a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so this is something that I uh, this is the way I think about it. Everybody, raise your hands. Who has a family, chosen or unchosen? If you have a family, people. Okay. We often use metaphors for family. Raise your hand if you actually get along with every member of your family and it's honky-dory and it's wonderful. <laughs> See one hand. You, the real MVP, tell the rest of us how y'all do it. My favorite joke is that getting my family into a room together maybe an hour before somebody starts fighting. And that's how it works. That's how people are. We are... We use these metaphors of this and that, but we don't look at how we got to them, what their use was and what their power is. If you talk about family, family is often the site for most abuse. It's the site where most hurt comes. But when, and then when you hear, have someone go, we're like a family, I'm like, oh God. <laughs> and, that, and some of that is that we don't tell the truth about what family does. We talk about community and we go, oh, we wanna have these soft and fuzzy, wonderful feelings. And that's not true, we don't do that. And we don't even do that with the symbolic thing we use to exemplify that. Like, oh yeah, we love our family. I'm like, okay, great, I love my mom, I love most of my family. I also don't wanna see them more than twice a year. <laughs> I think the word community gets used, like it gets used a lot in terrible ways, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I think about this in the media. My least favorite thing is when people say the business community. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not a community, that's a class. Right? That, is a that is a group of people who have similar political and economic interests. It's not a community. They're not all friends. I mean, they do all go to the meetings with Donald Trump, but like, that's not a community. And likewise, when we think about political communities, um, I always think of something my friend Yasmin Nair wrote a while ago, and she was like, you know, when it comes down to it, I don't trust my like, radical political queer community. I trust my friends. There's only gonna be so many people that we trust and we get along with and we care about. And the challenge is, you know, what are the things that we can, again, agree on, even if we don't like each other, agree on even if we're not gonna be in the same space, um, to move forward politically. Well, like not sort of making up this idea that it's gonna, we're all gonna get together and hold hands and, and sing, you know, Amazing Grace or whatever and it's gonna be magical, it's not. It's hard, we're not all gonna like each other. We're not all gonna be in community. We're not all gonna be friends. And these are different groups and we have to just like, I cringe a lot of the time when people apply the term community to things. Mm -hmm. I think one thing to jump in is, um, we all work I think in different aspects of community, either organizing or definitions. And I think it is um, sort of important to highlight like how, 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 like highlighting the labor that it takes to do community organizing or be involved in a community. For example, like the labor of putting together this event. How many different events that art and feminism have across the world? I think this is a fantastic example of like, this is a real labor, it is a labor of love, but it's also like a lot of hard work for it to actually exist and be galvanized. This is also just like we should give them all the like applause. Because I think it's worth 
highlighting like labor of community, that it is a labor, it's a labor that often is unrecognized as labor, that labor is maybe sometimes not translated into financial support or, um, you know, like bigger sy systemic or networked support. I think one of the things that I always, that we talk, that we talk about with Coral Project specifically and people who do online communities is the number one thing is what do you expect people to do while, when they're here? What, what are people, what is your community for? Or why, is, why, are, why are we here? Why is we here? Because that I think is more of the focusing point. And the other part is that there is a lot of, we work in a literary medium and this is where my pet peeves is where people say something is performative and I often want to beat them <laughs> with, the, with speech acts and research on performance theory because everything is performative, okay? It's all performative. But because it's all performative, that means that it all has certain goals, it all has certain outcomes, there are certain signals. What is the task that we intend to do? And one of the problems, and I think that this is the, the, the flip side that has really bothered me about organizing currently is nobody likes the unsexy stuff. Everybody wants to be an architect, nobody wants to be a plumber. So you get a lot of people who want to be, oh, I'm going to speechify, and oh, I want to be do this, and I want to do that. When, whew, what I would give for a radical project manager and a radical accountant, yes. you don't understand. Seriously, if we have any accountants in the room. It, the person who can put together an Excel spreadsheet and keep everybody on time is worth their weight in vibranium. But we do not have that person because we don't outreach to that person. We do not make that person feel valued. We do not feel that make that person feel like they are part of anything. So they constantly are looking for entry points and you get people who are loud or people who can show up and make a show rather than somebody who is, all right, when I go off, I take off all this makeup, I put on my sweats, I pull this hair back, and I need glasses, I need post-it notes, and I need to make sure that stuff goes from point A to point B. I need those people. Awesome, so I guess let's open it up to <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, do we have any from the live stream that are not online harassment comments? <laughs> Okay, any from the room at all? That are also not allowed to harassment? Yeah. No, no, no. Is there anything anybody wants to ask that isn't about the stuff we do or tell us or questions that you have about work that you are doing? Is it just too early on a yeah. Saturday? <laughs> roles. Sorry. Um, I was just really inspired by everything everyone said. Thank you for being here. I'm wondering, did you have um, mentor, personal mentors or professional mentors in your life that sort of opened up these floodgates for you to be able to do these amazing things, whether they were family, teachers, um, or someone you had early on in your professional career? I'd love to hear about them and how you worked with them to, um, to do this now. Or are you just completely a badass woman all on your own and, and you don't need that. <laughs> Nobody does everything, anything completely on our own. Uh, I, mean, I think it's worth sort of distilling or dispelling the myth of the lone genius, which gets used a lot about oh, yeah. men in technology. Because yeah. yeah. we all stand on the shoulders of giants, like yeah. my mom. My mom paid for like most of my school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I recently asked my mom like, why did we get a computer for our home? Like, and when did that happen? And, you know, my family's from Ethiopia. My mom uh, immigrated here when she was 25, like, was hearing about computers in the early 90s and was like, I don't know what this is, but like, people are starting to have these things in their homes. And like, I don't want you to, f I didn't want my kids to fall behind, you know, and like, bought us a computer, set it up, like, was like translating the manual, like, on the phone with someone, like, what does this mean? Like, I plugged the what into what? Um, like, and she set up the computer herself and had us, like, you know, it was like homework, like, after school, like, made sure we were on the computer, like, doing something, would buy CD ROMs, encyclopedia games, like, had us on the Carta. In Carta, exactly. <laughs> and so. Oh my God. <laughs> Like, and playing like magic school bus, like typing games to make sure we could like type quickly. Mavis Brown. Oh my Mavis God. Brown. Mavis, Mavis Brown. Begin. No, Mavis Begin. They, yes. And now it's, you know, we've, 
we're at this place where I'm doing things with technology with technology that she doesn't like. Com she has no idea what I'm doing, and and is like, whoa! It started with that computer, you know. Like it always starts with that computer in her. That was in her room, you know. Yeah. yeah. It has taken a village of people to do all of this, and I'm not the smartest person in in that village. Like there's. There's the West Indian Auntie Brigade. There's the the yeah. mentor. You, you you know how it is. Like it's like something is happening. You have to tell the aunts. How many of them are blood related to me? Not that many, but there <laughs> will be a crew of small women ready to critique every single one of my life choices <laughs> if I don't do what I'm supposed to. And that is that is just as important. And the the that I think is part of the, it, the myth of tech. And also, very honestly, we have to talk about how a lot of people don't want us here. Yeah. And that is just as much of it. Yeah. I am on a couple, in a couple newspapers on the covers as toxic. I'm actually getting a tattoo with that symbol on my body yeah. because spiteful. And, <laughs> and it takes sometimes not necessarily a mentor, but it takes a person who is just willing to not be the way everyone else is. Because yeah. I know for a fact people tried to make sure I didn't get hired into tech. People tried. And the person who hired me, who is a, a wonderful boss and also a friend, went, eh, no. It was not a big thing. It was not a big announcement. It wasn't a demonstration of a diversity and inclusion initiative. It wasn't loudness. It was, no gonna do it, she's good at the job. And that often does not happen as much as it does for other people. And it is this thing to think about for, think about how that happens. Because when I say who is we, the other part is even us on the panel have really different experiences of what it means to be feminist and womanist and what work in tech means and what equality will mean. Yeah. Because when we talk pay equality, yeah. I have a special relationship to pay equality because it's the day after my birthday. The, the day for pay equality for a black woman, which I am, is the, the day after my birthday. That's how much it takes, for, that's how much time it takes for me to make as much as a man from the year before. The time for white women is much earlier. Mm -hmm. The time for Latina women is much later. The time for native women is not even tracked. And we talk about equality and where, where equality is, I'd have to work every working day up until my birthday, which is July 30th, to get the same amount of money. A white woman would have to work till March too, and a white man works just till December 31st. I love that you mentioned um, the person hiring you and not being a big deal and just saying she's good at the job because like, I have been slagging on bosses. I'm going to say something nice about one of my bosses. But like, it's also a thing where then we feel, you can feel like you have to be incredibly grateful to the person who bucked the convention by hiring you. And we shouldn't, because you are good at the job. And that's not a thing that we should actually have to thank anybody for. That said, I had an incredible first boss who actually hired me into journalism. And I would not at all be where I am without her. And that is so rare because, yeah, I, I feel like I should say that like even women don't do this enough for other women because you, you can get into that spot and feel like you're special. And you can get into that spot and feel like, okay, I, I got this now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm one of the good ones. I'm, I made it in the meritocracy, which is a load of crap. Um, and so it's, it's a tough thing to balance to say like, I did make it here because I am good at this job. And also I got lucky, I'm white, I got hired when somebody else did not. Um, and I do have to thank people who you know, took a chance on me because I was not what they thought I should have been. Thank you. Those are all amazing and thoughtful answers. Um, Hi. Uh, this has been fascinating and very inspiring. It, what do we do when we leave here? I mean, do you, is there an organization? Do you recommend uh, anything to continue this inspiration and this thinking? And uh, where do you get your inspiration? I mean, I find this, everyone on this panel being in my inspiration because I love all the work that they do. Um, but I guess 
to sort of jump in first, I would say like, let's unpack that question a little bit. Um, support for who? Support for what? Um, I, I'm gonna ask all the panelists to maybe describe like, like organizations or work that they're doing that is maybe specific to them. So it's not so much of like, let's all, let's all cohesively come to an answer because there's a lot of different people in this room with a lot of different experiences that need a lot of different kinds of support. Support doesn't necessarily scale all the time and one solution for one group will not work for another. Yeah, I kind of want to throw the question back to you of like which part of what we've talked about is the thing that you're inspired by that you want to connect to because that's going to have a whole lot of different um, answers, right? Like I, I say, you know, if you have money, there's a whole list of people who could use some of your money, um, especially if you can like afford to do monthly donations and set up regularly recurring monthly donations. Um, that's great because then you don't have to think about it ever again and they'll just keep charging your credit card. is real. Student loan debt is real. Um, if you want to get involved and do things, if you're an accountant, um, I bet we can find people who could use radical accountants. Like, oh, yeah. if you have particular skill sets that you know that you maybe didn't think would be useful to a movement, but like, I bet we can figure out ways that they would be. Um, so that's you know, they're tough questions. I mean, I also like to take a moment and highlight everyone on this panel has a way that you can interact with them. Um, Salome runs an art space in bed power plant. Sarah has a book. Sadet has an amazing Patreon and a series of work she's been working on. Um, if you want to go like down to the contributor level, like we have contributors here. Um, but if you want to get bigger and global, you know, we're also all part of bigger and global things. Sarah is with the Nation Institute. Sadet is with the Mozilla Foundation and uh, was working on the Coral Project and now is an editor at large. The Coral Project is one of my favorite, favorite initiatives and organizations. Salome is with the Ford Foundation, had an amazing residency at IBEAM. I also had a residency there. Um, I think like, so we've scaled up one more level. So like what's another level of scale, right? Beyond all of us. I'm gonna do what I do to you a lot is, I'm gonna scale down. Yeah. Is, what do you love? What do you really love? What excites you? What makes you get out of bed in the morning? What brings you joy? And what is a way you can make it easier for other people to have that same feeling? I really love books and manuscripts. I really love reading and I love all that stuff. And when I, people say, what is the thing you would really like to work on is like, how do we make stuff actually really accessible? What is, how would I make information really compliant, like ADA and compliant, multilingual and compliant? And my, one of my passions is immigration. I'm a first generation immigrant. So one of the things that I hope to do as movement work is how do I get everybody to put out documents that can be accessed by everyone? That's, that's what I love to do. That's what I want to do. If you really like theater, one of the things that we talk about work is Alvin Ailey, they are renegotiating their contract for dancers. How do we help those folks? How do we show them support? We are looking at re a lot of spaces where we can be, and sometimes it's not big, sometimes, and, and, and also, it's not always money. Money is great, money, but money, again, is an invented concept, is finding what you love and how you can be kinder to people with it. And that is often, the in data and tech, this is the thing we missed, and the emotions, and the art, and the feeling against your body is that we build the button, ding, ding, ding. It's like, so what is this, how is this gonna be kind? And that is often what I ask people first before we run off and like be charged is, what do we wanna do? Why do we wanna do it? How can we bring love to every single aspect of it? Not perfection, not, not making mistakes, but love. Hi. Um, my question is sort of about how do you find the courage to keep doing the work when I think a lot of these forces that you talk about sometimes seem very overwhelming and like, um, you know, almost unchangeable or something that you can do, you know, feeling powerless against forces that we've talked about today. Um. I mean, I, 
like in workshop series I've hosted recently, I've seen a lot of, I mean, the assumption always is that when we host these speculative design workshops that younger people are gonna show up. But recently I've seen older people show up, like not just folks in their 20s and 30s, not people in their 40s, I'm talking about people in their 60s, you know, show up to like learn about virtual reality. Yeah, learn about 3D printing. Um, and to like be silly with us, you know? And for me, that's become an inspiration to that someone could, can come back and, and be open and be vulnerable and to ask questions with us and to add new skill sets. Um, that's, insp that's like what, where I wanna be always, you know? Um, so that's where I'm, I'm seeking like my battery right now. I think a lot of it for me is um, putting on my online harassment researcher hat, um, is learning how to find support, but also like when I take support off the internet. So I have like a group of people that I text or I, I call when I feel like something is, like when I need advice or I need a moment to pause. And so for me, it was the realization that like this is a real network and like reaching out to that network um, during specific times and recognizing like when I need support and what support sort of started to look like. Um, it's less of an optimistic s story, but it's something where I started, I started thinking about sustainability and like the joy in crafting, like looking at my friendships as things that I needed and that how necessary they were that, that it, and like really actually recognizing like support and being open and honest about like, I need to talk to someone right now. So I have two things. One um, is that I'm a journalist and I cover social movements and that means over the last 10 years I've met a lot of amazing people and I go look at their social media profiles and see what they're doing. And like, you know, there's this thing that like Mr. Rogers apparently someone once said about like look for the helpers and mine is like there is a protest happening somewhere and I am gonna go on Facebook and look around and see who is causing some trouble. Right now, the West Virginia teachers have been on strike for seven days now. Um, they are raising some hell, and they're wearing like costumes, like a friend of mine is down there, and there is like a crab costume with a like, don't be shellfish. Teachers are great, y'all. Um, <laughs> So stuff like that, or the kids having walkouts. There were um, students in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, who had a walkout in support of their teachers. Um, there are folks marching to DC right now for the DREAM Act, like just like looking around at all that. The other piece of advice is like sort of the opposite of that, which is like give yourself permission to not follow everything. Um, connected to the like, what do you love and what do you care about? You know, I have just outsourced chunks of like the news to other people, like I've got friends who cover this thing, and this is again a thing that comes from working in the media, but like, you know, there are just some people that I'm like, all right, if this thing blows up and becomes a thing I need to know about, this person will let me know. I will see it because they're doing it. And so I'm gonna drill down in the things that I follow. I follow labor, I follow the movements, I follow the immigration stuff that's happening right now because it's all, you know, and this is what I'm gonna make sure I'm up on. And everything else I'm just gonna have to like, because there's only so much I can do. I don't, I don't, I don't always feel it and have it and have it for people. And that is the first way of getting good at doing this. The, your life is not the fight. Your life is not a fight. Your life is not supposed to be the thing where you just battle everyone you see. And that is something that I had to learn. And that is something that you have to actually deal with because there's a lot of, one of the things that I've become very vo vocal about is that I have PTSD. It is not, my, a lot of what people see is your, my strength is me functionally using a maladaption that is making me sick. My body pumps adrenaline at certain times in ways that honestly will make me faint. And it happens to a lot of people. That's not healthy. This is not something to be admired. And you build in things where, the wait for me to continue, I have a friend who I call and I cry. I cry heaving sobs where she's really worried because she doesn't live in the same city as I am. And she listens to me cry. And I do that for other people. There are times when I'm just like, well, not reading anything. 
I'm not going through this. Not, not my monkey, not my circus. <laughs> and that's a, my friend Lene says that all to me all the time, but there is, <laughs> but there is, there is this weirdness of we believe that revolutions and movements are full of superheroes and people who are never have bad days and it's people yeah. and people will people. So there will be days where you will wake up and be like, I can't do this. And you know what you do? You don't do it. So we have time for one last question. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I w was pointing great, right. but oh, but it's. Hi, so thank you for coming today. Um, it was really interesting hearing your perspectives, especially as a high school student. Um, specifically, like, um, uh, <laughs> so like at school, they kind of teach us, and it's understandable why, like when you're working with people, it's important to understand where they're coming from, their perspectives, and try to work with them. But it was interesting to hear here that sometimes you can't always do that. Sometimes you gotta kind of work separately from them, and just, you're able to still work with them even though you might not like, like them or be friendly with them or understand them. And that seems more realistic, but it's just that ideally, like as a person, I would want to try and get to know them and f to have them understand me as well and like me even. So how do you reconcile that? First of all, I want to say that's a really great question and totally something I wish I had been thinking of when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah, y'all are going to save the world. Yeah, like y'all are right there. Um, yeah, because I was not thinking that stuff in high school. I was watching like way too much anime. Um, <laughs> I think I like to go into situations and try to like be as friendly as possible and get everyone on the same page and also like work as best as I can and be as positive and hopefully like we can be friends. Um, and sometimes that's just not possible. And I think maybe the, the bigger thing is, is to take away from it is don't feel bad, like if that happens. Mm -hmm. Because like people are people. Like people come to work and they're coming from different situations, right? Like when you show up to an event, we're all coming from different places. Like maybe it took someone two hours to get there and they couldn't find someone to watch their kid or their mom's in the hospital, right? Or they're just having a bad day. Or maybe someone's having a great day. Maybe you are also in a situation where people have different ways of communicating. Um, maybe you're working with someone that is really, really bad at communication. Maybe someone is having an anxiety attack, right? There's a lot of different reasons that maybe when you're in a situation working with someone, it's just not working with them. And that's not uh, a reflection of you or your skills. Um, so I think it's, I think we should all go into situations, this is me being like an optimist and like super friendly, like we should all be friends, but like sometimes it's just not possible. And that's okay. And I think it's like okay to acknowledge that of like, all right, cool, like I can respect you. Um, and also respecting the fact that sometimes people are like sometimes people just actually don't want to build those kinds of emotional bridges with you or with anyone. And we should be respectful of that too. Right? Mm -hmm. Also recognize that what you've described is your way. And that is works in two ways that your way is not everyone's way. And, a, and I say this as a kind of a bubbly, gregarious personality, is that for some people that is a lot, and it is advertised as like the way people should be and it's great for people, and, but if you are an introvert and you have to deal with me, if I'm not careful, that is, that's, that's, it's not kind, it's not good. It's me forcing the way I am on you, and I've gotta be careful of that. And the flip side of that is that, that it's also your way so you get to be that way. You don't have to change that for anyone. If you want to be friendly and you want to try, you get to be that way. There, no, there's, no, there's no prescriptive way, and there shouldn't be, for you to be success and to have work. What is important is, that have, is when you work with people, figure out ways for you to be able to be yourselves and work together with what you need to do as the people you are with the people you need and not as, so how do we get to this kind of generalized overarching thing? And even though I'm usually bubbly, I also like to say understanding people, getting along with people, and working with people are not the same thing. So I understand a lot of the people I threaten to punch in the face. Still gonna punch them. 
I love it. I love it. And also, the thing is that, like, the work of getting along with people is gendered work. It's racialized work. It's work that is expected of some people when you, you will be expected to be nice and get along with people that will not be expected to extend the same courtesy to you. And that that, the thing to do in those moments is to recognize those inequalities, right? Is to say like, this person is a jerk to me and I am expected to take it and be nice anyway and I don't have to do that. And to also recognize that like, there will be sanctions if you don't do it sometimes. Like I wanna be really real about that. It takes a lot, it takes a long time. I'm 38 years old and I've just gotten to a point where I can say no to people. Um, it's hard, but that is a, a thing that like, you can take that into those places when you're trying to be nice to somebody and, and give yourself permission to be like, this isn't fair. And I also wanna be very, very clear about this for you, looking at you, you are lovely. You are the best judge of your safety. You don't have to do it. You can say no, but if you think that you won't get out of that room safe or you won't get what you need to be safe, if you say no, it is okay. You have done nothing wrong by trying to get out alive and get to the next day and figure out how to process after. I am, this is, sorry, I'm gonna take this moment because I'm the child of an immigrant. I'm a child of a deportee. And I have very specific feelings about the, this idea of resistance is for everyone. Resistance is for everyone, but it looks different for everyone. Yeah. And you gotta take care of yourself. Yeah. You gotta take care of yourself. And what it takes to take care of yourself will vary. And you are no less of a revolutionary. You are no less of a brilliant person. You are no less of a fighter if you take a look at the situation and go, I'm not doing this one right now. Yep. I'm gonna retreat, I'm gonna go to where I am safe, and I will figure it out. And if you need that, that is fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah rechar recharging is so important. Like, I, I think that it takes a kind of emotional, intellectual, social labor to do this kind of work, and like, knowing that that depletes, right, mm -hmm. and that you don't need to like waste all of that energy and labor on one person to get to feel validated by them or to get them to like you. Like, don't waste all that energy on somebody. Yeah. Save it for yourself. Take care of yourself. You know, like return that joy and love onto yourself. And one thing I, I will say is also like niceness and kindness, even if it's a natural part of yourself, it is also a labor. Um, a lot of like what my day-to-day -day job is is actually listening to like traumatic events people have undergone and how like systems they exist and have failed them. And so I like with my friends, I've had to tell them like if you have a problem, like I need you to be very as direct as you can with me because I spend all day untying thorny knots as best I can for people when they're being deeply emotionally affected. And so I think it's okay to sort of acknowledge like um, there's this thing called spoons, like spoon theory. And sometimes you only have enough spoons in the day, and the more tasks you do, the less spoons you have. It's not, th it, like, describing spoon theory sounds crazy because it doesn't actually, like, sound logical, because you're like, I mean, I don't know, I have lots of spoons in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> but it comes specifically from disability and the mental health thing, where if you have spoons and you have a limited amount of time based on mental health effects. So what I like to use is put a pin in it, and being very clear with someone like, I hear you, I want you to understand that this has happened, we're gonna put a pin in it until I have the ability to, or someone else has an ability to, or, and all of my friends yell, yell, yell at me about this, write that down. <laughs> Just write it down, write it down somewhere, you and I, you, I, and a, box of, a bottle of wine, you and I, and a completely unhealthy dessert, we'll get back to it but giving your space to have time. So if it's just like, if someone is really just everything, and you, you can, it's gonna be like, okay. But also like, don't feel bad if you wanna be nice to people. <laughs> Cause that's really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and you should, you should do all the things you wanna do and be the way that you wanna be. And like, that's super admirable. It takes a lot of strength to be kind in a world that doesn't often value that. Yeah. Yeah. So just by saying, I want to be kind every day, you're saying that I want to be amazingly yeah. strong, and that is dope. Thank you so much.
so much. Oh yeah, so uh, I think <laughs> I would like to sort of conclude our panel. And I want to give a big round of applause for the panelists. Um, and again, I want to give a, a really big round of applause for the art and feminism team. Because it is five years old and that is a lot of work and a lot of fantastic work for how big this has become. And I think we actually should give them another round of applause.